Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 47 of PodCana. This week, we have a tournament report for you. Both Kawa and Moyen went to a large tournament in Poznan, um, Poland, I believe. I believe that is the location. We're also going to be updating some of our evaluations and talking more about store championships, what we think the meta will be, what decks will bring. Surprisingly, I say surprisingly, but it's been like this for, God, three sets in Larkana. But surprisingly, still, months into the format, the format is so dynamic. The decks are changing. The list, the, the lists are changing. The top decks are changing because everything is so meta dependent, right? It really, it really matters what's going to show up. And we've seen so many changes even in just the last week. So even from our last video, I probably, I think I've swapped a complete, to a completely different ink combination of what I might bring to the store championships. But even if I did stay on Ruby Amethyst, the, the entire list would have changed in the course of seven days. So we're going to be getting into that anyway. Let's just let's just hit it from a high level, guys. Talk to me about the tournament in Poznan. Talk to me specifically about the logistics of getting there. So, like, what was the, talk to me about the travel, the venue, the format? Just break it down for the people. Uh, I I guess I'll start off. My travel was uh actually I would say usually kind of a nightmare because uh, I had like an eight hour layover in Italy, but it was actually really cool. I got to explore a whole city for eight hours. It was really really cool. Uh. Venue was pretty awesome. There was loads of space. I would say for the most part, it was pretty well organized. The format was uh, day one, it was eight rounds of Swiss. And then day two, it was uh, top 32. I believe there was 159 players that actually attended, which I'm not going to lie, was actually a little bit smaller than what I anticipated. I, originally, I thought they said they stated somewhere that they had like over 200 players already. But uh, this is a smaller amount of people. Obviously, some people may not have been able to make it due to travel or whatever. But... Um, yeah, that was my experience. We had a good group of people there. Um, you know, a few content creators, obviously got to meet up with Moyne and a few of the boys. So it was a great time. And like you you mentioned, Brendan, like the, the decks and the meta it was extremely, extremely diverse. But of course, we'll 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 jump into it. So over to you, Moyne. Yeah, for me it was just a very um good experience meeting other people that I already knew, but also getting to to meet so many new people that that love the game we love. Um, but also it was my first time playing the game in paper, except for like the very first Gamescom event. So that, that was also something I feel like, um, now I, n now I'm at this point where I don't need to think about where I put my cards and stuff anymore and stuff. So, um, that, 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 that's already good. And yeah, I, I enjoyed the event a lot, it's, I guess. The few downsides would be like the top tables were set up a little bit wonky. If you leaned mm -hmm. on it, it, you, it almost flipped. Um, the stream setup, there was, I think, no casting and the setup yep. was a little wonky. But other than that, I'm, I'm still like very happy with, with how the event went for like a grassroot type uh, tournament. Yeah, and you guys both brought Amber Steel. Talk to me a little bit why you brought mm -mm. Sapphire Steel. Sapphire Steel. Sapphire Steel. That's what I meant to say. I I feel like even even like one year into this, I'm still getting the the color names mixed up because <laughs> they're like Sapphire Root. They're all these weird names. Anyway, you guys both brought what the community refers to as Blue Steel. I don't know why they do that, but yeah, you guys both brought Blue Steel. Talk to me about why you picked that deck and how you felt to this position in the metagame. Also, give me the sort of post mortem. You know, after the tournament, do you feel like you brought the correct deck? You can start mine. Um, yeah, you go for it. Yeah, I, th I'm, I think I'm happy with what I bought. I think it, the deck was well positioned in the meta with like the biggest weakness being blue red. And in this type of event, I felt like um, bringing blue red yourself is very risky. And even if you do bring blue red yourself, um, just facing um, any type of aggressive deck early um, can be so detrimental because as soon as you lose one of the earlier rounds, you might end up in a bracket with worse matchups. And so I thought that I just need to dodge blue red for a little bit and then I shouldn't be facing it too much later on. But there's actually a few blue reds that uh, had a good record or even made it into top cut where unfortunately I also faced... I, so I, I was 1-2 very early mm -hmm. and faced a blue red and they win the die roll. Somehow I win that match, but then in top 32 I faced blue red again. They... Um, they have the dice, which means I, I almost won that one too, but th th that matchup is, is extremely hard to win. Um, overall, I'm still very happy with the choice. One thing, though, that I hadn't totally considered was I, a few of my opponents were 
playing a little bit slow, not not even on purpose. And some of the opponents that I two out, I don't think I could have played three games against them, no matter how quick I play with Blue Steel. So that's something to consider. Yeah, I know, Kali, you probably had a similar experience also playing Blue Steel. Yeah, yeah, very, very similar. I, a lot of slow play happened, and I did, I did call George a few times about it, because it is quite frustrating, because oftentimes you... You know, if you even lose the first one or you decide to scoop and then you win the second one and there's like 10 minutes left, like mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I want to play, I want to play. And your opponent's like picking up their cards and starting to show. I'm like, I want to play this game. And I also had people numerous times at like the 10 minute stage when I want to play game three saying, oh, like, you know, you can take a, a, a draw if you want or you could like sit multiple, multiple times. And that shit really pisses me off because I just want to play the game. Like stop talking to me about that, like play the game. Even if I lose, it's better for my opponent that one of us, one of us wins. Um, but yeah, coming back to the the deck choice and stuff like that, I was pretty happy with the the deck I brought. Unfortunately, I just had like a a, a, a tough few first games. My my main obstacle being uh, a few amber steel decks I I played against. It was actually it was close, but it was um it was it was a loss in the end. And the biggest culprit being uh, this Pride Lands deck, which we're definitely going <laughs> to talk about in, in this pod. Uh, Turn one, I ink my rise. Turn two for them, they go Pride Lands. Turn three, they go for a second Pride Lands, and that's the game. Like it's it's actually insane how how powerful that card is. Myself and Moyne discussed it a lot. We said it's nearly kind of like a combination of flute and lantern together. So yeah, can't wait to dive into that deck. Overall, I'm gonna say that I did kind of consider bringing blue red myself post travel to the tournament. And looking back at it now, I think I actually would have been quite comfortable on. Blue red. I had the same thought as Moyen that I thought, you know, if there's a lot of aggressive decks, you kind of end up in that like really weird bracket. But I think I didn't. I anticipated that I would see more Ruby Amethyst, hence why I brought Blue Steel because I think that deck just has such a great matchup into Ruby Amethyst. But ultimately, I think we, we saw in the past like three major events, Amber Steel do so well, and a lot of people brought that deck. And if I think that a room's going to be filled more with Amber Steel, then I'm and even Blue Steel then I would actually feel pretty comfortable on Blue-Red. But it's always that risk that you take, right? I think for this specific tournament, obviously looking at it now, I think if, personally, if I brought Blue-Red, I might have performed a little bit better. But I also don't think I played badly at all. I think the matchups were just uh, pretty tricky, to be honest. Oh, also, Harlan, who was at the event, I think he got the worst bit of variance. Um, or basically, his tournament displayed what could can go wrong if you bring Blue-Steel, because his... I think he ID'd once, but other than that, um, his only losses were he faced blue red twice in the in the Swiss, and then final round round he needs the win, and he was about to win, but opponent played slow, and then he didn't get it over the line with blue steel. So that that feels like there wasn't much they could have done to to get around that. Yeah, yeah. if I'm reading between the lines, um, first of all, it was a best of three format, from what I understand, right? Mm -hmm. So best of three, mm -hmm. yeah. Best of three in Lorcana, and it has been this it's been this way since S one set one. If you don't play on, on Pixel, you do play in paper. Finishing three games with any sort of mid range or control deck is atrocious. Like it, it is just like it's really rough. Not only do you need to be playing exceedingly fast, and your opponent needs to be doing the same, um, but it still feels like if you have anywhere near like the the one side of the deviation curve of like more grindy sort of more attrition based games like you're just not going to finish three i remember recently i was playing in paper and i i won game one and we were on game two game two i was of course on the draw and i probably still had like a solid 10 to 20 percent to win the game over the course of a and i just strategically conceded game two i was just like i just have to go game three because even if i if, if by some if by some chance i do not win this game in the next 10 minutes like i like it we're going to draw for sure so it's um I'm really happy they're switching over to the two game format. I won't call it best of two, so two game format. Um still not happy about the plus one point to two oh, but I do think that it's way better than best of three. Like it, best of three in fifty in fifty or sixty minutes, whatever it was, was just not enough time, in my opinion. And and then call what you mentioned as well. You can have people playing slow because they're thinking and they're facing complex decisions, but you can also encounter players that are playing slow because it's their might be their first time encountering playing the game in paper, like one of their first times playing the game at all. And yeah, it's just, it's really tough to finish three games of Lorcan. I'd be mean, borderline impossible if you're not playing aggro deck. So yeah, sounds mm -hmm. like that was a takeaway you guys had was that you did not have enough time. 
Yeah, I, I, for me, it was actually fine. I had three Ruby Amethyst rounds, and all of them finished with like 15 minutes left on the clock. But all of these, those three times, I was playing fast. My opponent was experienced and was playing fast. And then it's actually kind of doable. But you are always on the rush. And honestly, they could have probably slowed played me if they wanted to. Um, because they, the games take, you, there's enough game actions where if you pause between each of them, that, that will be a problem. But also, at the event, we had one of one of the the artists for the game, which was signing cards. And now I I don't I don't have a lot of cards, but but I, I won twelve. I think bought like eight more, and I opened one heart of the uh, Tefiti <laughs> that yes. I now got signed by uh, Kamil Mursin from, nice. from Poland. That's nice. That's cool. And, they um, have the artists out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he was a Polish artist. I actually sat next to him and I had a, a nice discussion with him. He was saying. Uh, yeah, we, we were all we were all basically asking him like, oh, trying to get some info about set four, what's coming, what's coming, and he was like, oh, he kind of took a break for a little bit, so I don't think we're gonna see any more of his cards until like set five and set six, which is interesting. But uh, I kind of found it funny because uh, it's tough because like when he laid out all the cards in front of him that he has made so far, I was like, oh my god, like none of these cards are playable. Like it's it's so I'm like, bro, it's so it's so tough. Actually, that's kind of a lie. One of them, one of them was definitely playable in set one. It was uh, White Rabbit's Pocket Watch, which is a pretty cool card to oh, be yeah. honest. You give the give the card a uh, rush, rush, but I think since Ma since Madam Infox Fox is <laughs> coming to the meta, that card is uh, heavily heavily underplayed. So well, Hats Off Defeat is probably the best the best card. Honestly, the probably right the best card. He he did like the two five. The three cost two five SME, which is kind of cool. But and I think I remember time. telling, I think I remember telling Moin, oh, he made SME, and Moin was like, Moin's eyes look, he's like, <laughs> SME, and I was like, no, it's the bad one. He's like, oh, <laughs> I would have been so happy. Also, yeah. I have to admit one thing. Mm -hmm. to, oh yes, to Brendan. So yeah, the, we we we've, we've got an announcement live. We 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 did not tell Brendan this uh, post recording, but Moin, you, you got to announce it live here. What 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 you did? So you know, it was an eight round format, and with our the, the amount of players that we had, usually around nine out of twenty seven five threes would make it, um, which is reasonable enough. But that's in, that's assuming no ties, and I was going into final round being five two, and I mean I felt really bad about it because I hate it. But then again, I know it was like part of part of the game and part of the rules, so I knew if I tie, I. I I make top cut, and so my ID? opponent also asked. Yeah, I did. Yeah. That's my my first time in my life. It's I but, think it's a legitimate strategic decision. Uh, I think it's yeah. yeah. It's just it's just how the rules play out. Um, the only time I, 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 don't, it, I don't like it is when so the I, I, don't, I actually don't really care. But the time it's in my opinion when it's cringe is like when you're going to a super low stakes tournament and you get the top eight, and it's like mm -hmm. you're playing for a box, and then the top eight's like. Y'all want to split? It's like the weirdest, like risk aversion of like splitting, like just like very cheap product. You're like, uh, yeah. okay. So, so Moy, Moy's going to talk about story. another reason why <laughs> he, he also ex split the product. No, I, I don't no, know. Moy, Moy I, didn't, I didn't make it. No, no, no. Moy, Moy didn't make it. Moy didn't get that far. No, no. I, so I mean, I lost in top thirty-two. I'm not splitting my twelve packs. Um, <laughs> but I, I did somewhat flame the top four because not only did they split, which I don't think it was truly necessary with the price split we had, which was like three boxes for fourth place. I maybe. think it was. I, I personally think it was, but... I mean, I don't know. So f first and second do get quite a few more boxes, but I think it's still not the most outrageous split, um, normal price split. And then, then they decided to split, but what, what I didn't like about it was that they decided to split completely equally. And I, I am a very passionate player about the game. I during the entire top uh, 16 matches and top 8 matches, I, I was standing around the tables trying to keep my distance, but like watching every single game or going on because I was genuinely interested with it, in it. And then top 4 starts and they're not playing for shit except for the trophy. Um, so I, I couldn't care to watch anymore, which I'm sorry, but if you're not playing for something, then I feel like I've Better yeah, so your do. your optimal split is like you still add incentivization to win, which I guess a trophy like kind of does that, but yeah, ultimately I don't care. It's just like when it's just funny to me when I whenever I do play super low stakes tournaments and people come up trying to split like what is the equivalent of a couple dollars? I'm like, <laughs> what are we doing? I think I think it's worse if I kind of agree with Moyen if there's more of a spectator audience. Like for us standing there, whatever, it, mm. it's, you know, if, if, it, if it's broadcast, right? Imagine there's one of these Lord Cannon challenges and this will not happen. I, I highly doubt this will happen, right? 
and it's like you know top eight or top four or whatever and they just say you yeah, know we're not playing mm. like they did that in flesh and blood once oh really yeah they, it, it actually implemented a rule um so basically like one of the first tournaments they put up ten thousand dollars it was when the game was really young and the entire top eight split evenly and the creator of the game was pissed so yeah, like, what, I would DQ what, all of them for life. He, well, GG. that that is now the rule that you do get nice. DQ. Like, what happened for the like? Did they have like a broadcast line of the casters? Like, oh, they split by everyone. Um, no, they didn't have a broadcast back then. But nowadays, and so I think that honestly, uh, Kyle, I think that will happen. But it'll probably happen like the final. It happens all the time. It's really common, especially when those uh, the prizes are pretty. How can you how can you split promos? Is what I'm saying. Um, so one person gets the promo, one person gets the cash. So you can put an EV value on the promo. So like, let's say there was promo and cash available. Uh, there's not for this game. Mm-hmm. Um, you would do one person gets cash, one person gets the promo, or you just collectively pull together, you sell it, and then you split the cash. Uh, yeah, I after. mean that. So that that's not very convenient. I think the the common splits are like, let's say there's a, to- a card you get for top eight, and there's a more expensive card you get for top four. Then like a common split people do is like, um. The, to- the winner still gets their most ex- more, more expensive card, but at least they give like the li- less expensive cards to the loser. So the loser got like the top eight card twice, which is still less than the top four card. Mm. And basically, I'm, I've, I've, I've stated my my stance on this on this part, I think, numerous times. I think splitting's not splitting's completely fine as long as the winner still gets significantly more, so that everyone can still care about the game. Yeah. yeah, but I I just want to finish that off by saying I personally think that the split was fine for this event because I think Spessy ended up getting fourth, so he made top four. He would have walked away with three boxes, and I think when they all split, they all got ten boxes each, which yeah, again, like I, I don't wanna I don't wanna go into like the EV mindset and stuff like that, but if you equate that to monetary value, that's like one K each, which is like I don't know. I I take that. Like if I if I won that, I would have went straight down to a vendor and be like, "Do you want to just buy these boxes off me?" Yeah, where, I, where I'm me. at. So my my actual stance, my actual stance of splitting is I legitimately do not care. Sometimes I mean people because I think it's it's cowardly and it, it's just kind of funny. Um, I I actually do it more for comedic effect, but I don't think that anybody should be pressured into splitting that doesn't want to, and that happens mm. all the fucking time. You get these people to come up to you and like, why don't you split? Why don't you do this? They make you to be the bad guy, and it's like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, that is that is the, what that is what I don't like about splitting is when people socially pressure someone who doesn't want to split into doing so and treat them like they're the the they're the bad guy when they don't want to split. If you're um, going into top court and people are coming up to you saying you want to split, especially if you know that you're so favored, like imagine you know that you're going to go first, right? You, you have the die roll on your side. You know that, oh, my deck literally beats all these other ones in top court. I'm so favored. And the person says, no, I don't want to split. The, like they've, 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 that's, they, they can play. They should play. There should be no reason to give out to someone for doing that, right? I don't know if I ever told this story on the podcast, but this is the last thing before we move on to more Lorcana stuff is one time in a flesh and blood tournament, my friend is locked for top eight. He's going into his final round. Doesn't matter for him. It doesn't matter for seeding and, and seeding is important in flesh and blood. You get to choose if you want to go first or second in flesh and blood. You, a lot of times you choose to go second, um, but it's advantageous. And his opponent is playing the counter deck to his deck. And he's like, he wants him to concede to him so he can concede him in the top eight. And he's like, no, <laughs> but he's they were acquaintances at best, but this person was so offended that he wouldn't concede him. And he was like, there's, there's two reasons. Like one, he, the seeding matters. And two, he doesn't want him in top eight. That's the counter deck. It was like, it was like this, it was insane. Like that just, that part did not click. Ultimately, the guy who wanted to get conceded in top eight loses, still gets in an eighth and then beats my friend in the, uh, in top eight because his deck is like, his deck was super kind of favored deck. to win. Yeah. It was like mm. super favored to win. Um, it's a funny situation. Okay, next up on the headlines, Morris, I want to give you a chance to shout out more of your coaching info or like just clarify it more because you had people fall off from last podcast, just in case anybody's not clear. Um, yeah, I mean, you can probably best DM me on Twitter for, for coaching queries. It's, but honestly, we don't need to, to, to advertise it more <laughs> because otherwise I won't have time to, to, to play this game all the time if I, if I need to coach all the time. <laughs> but but I, I appreciate all the, all the, the questions and stuff. And mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to, to doing some crochet. Yeah. I want to ask you guys, this is kind of a main topic thing, but 
The post the tournament in Poznan, has this changed your strategy approaching the set championships at all? Like specifically in regards to blue steel, are you thinking like, okay, maybe blue steel is a week or two behind the meta going into the set championships? Or do you still think that that might be the, the correct deck? I, I, pers I personally think that um, most of what I expected going into the Poland tournament more or less turned out to be true. And at the same time, I learned more about, about the meta, but I wouldn't exclude any of the top decks from my thinking because even until I'm playing, until we're playing the set championships, there's still time until that where I think the meta will keep shifting. So we'll just need to stay on top of that to to capitalize. Mm -hmm. yeah, All right, I agree. Um, yeah, in other news, we had multiple players hit rank rank one with Amber Steel. We'll be talking about some of those lists in the main topic, and they'll be included in the description below if you want to see them. One was Zan, the other one was Savige. They both hit rank one with Amber Steel. Uh, next up, there was a set championship influencer tournament in the UK. Colin, what the? F I know nah, you're. Bro. I know you're in Ireland, Colin, but you are close. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, it's a funny story. So uh, we heard about it that it was the weekend. Spessy told us that he had to change his flights because he got a mm -hmm. anonymous email like the Friday saying, oh, there's this like UK influencer tournament in the Disney store for the set championship. Do you want to come? And obviously, I mean, I'd change my flights if they asked me 100%. But um, yeah, I think there was just like eight players that were kind of testing. This. It's actually funny that one of the guys who won, Lorcana Villain, who's uh, mm -hmm. really well known within the community, uh, does some great content. He, uh, I think he actually came first and he posted a picture on Twitter of him with the playmat and him with the, the card and the amount of people that like thought it was like fake and all this stuff was so, so funny because obviously the the videos or whatever probably haven't come out yet or yeah. if they have, it was it was afterwards. But um, yeah, I think from my understanding, it was pretty much just kind of like a, a, a media event to show what the Stitch Championships are going to be like uh anyone from ravensburger if you are listening to this podcast i would love to take part in any of these in the future i will i will easily come over to the uk also you know we have a disney store here in dublin so you can always do one do one here if you want to but um yeah it was really cool to see honestly super 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 cool to see and uh, a lot of the people that were there i mean some of them i i didn't know but i did also know a lot of them so it's nice to see that they're highlighting highlighting some lorcana content creators for sure yeah, are there videos? Like, it, I haven't seen... Uh, if you go on Lorcana Villain's channel right now, he did a whole kind of vlog thing of him going through the Disney store and also really talking about the deck list he brought, stuff like that. So uh, I don't know if there's, like, a, anything official from Disney Lorcana at the moment, but definitely check out um, Lorcana Villain's YouTube channel. And he, he's made some, like, awesome content already. But, yeah, mm -hmm. that'll kind of showcase what the event was about. All right. Uh, next up, info. They did increase... I think we talked about this maybe a little bit last week. I can't remember. But they increased player caps. Um, they actually started rolling out player caps for the upcoming Lille and Atlanta events. Uh, they increased them to 2K. They started rolling out tickets to the waitlist. Um, I did not get a ticket. So I was not on the waitlist because... When the sale initially went up, I was at the Flesh and Blood Pro Tour, so I didn't. I was actually near a computer, so it's not like I tried to get one. And I didn't. I didn't even know they were going up for sale. Um, so I am on the wait list now, but I did not get a ticket, which honestly is no big deal. I think that the other events will have plenty of room, most likely. This is just the first one, so I might not get into it. So, yeah, just uh, just letting you know if you didn't know, they updated to 2K, and you haven't checked your email, and you might be on the wait list. I think they give you like a 24 hour period to buy, so it's like very, very. Um, um, I don't know what the word would be, but like you, you have plenty of time. Like they're giving you a lot of allowance to actually get your ticket if you were on the wait list. So check that out. Um, anyway, let's head into this building uh, question section. This is our listener question section. If you want to hear your question read right on next week's pod, you can choose a comment on YouTube and we'll get it queued up. All right. First comment from the lore content fam. Missed location lore. Uh, missing location lore really is a problem at IRL. I've started putting my locations really close to my deck so that I can see them when I draw at the start of turn uh habit binding yeah, yeah we we uh discussed this and i i think it's gonna be mentioned in the comments a little bit down below but a big thing we kind of discussed and i'm pretty sure the official ruling now from what i understand is if it's your turn and you're supposed to track your lore that came from the location you pretty much have until the end of your turn to be like oh i didn't add the lore for my location now if there are effects or whatever that would actually cause you to lose the game in that time or like you know stuff that would interrupt that then that doesn't matter but until you essentially if you if you if, if it becomes your turn start of your turn you miss the location giving you lore and you end your turn 
after you end your turn, you can't say, oh, I missed my, my lore, can I get that back? You can't. So it has to be pretty much on the turn. I, I think that's a fair, fair judgment call. Yeah, I think someone mentioned that it's a GRV on a game rule violation on both ends. But um, one thing I want to mention, mm, yep. because uh, this person mentioned putting the location close to their deck, I put it, if I have a location lore trigger or a draw trigger, um, either or, I put dice on top of my deck. So when I go to draw my card for the turn, it is a physical reminder that there is something that I need to be doing before I draw that card. So that's what I do. And it helps me a lot. I never forget. I think, I think the... The Queen's Castle is the most dangerous one because I think if you miss the draw trigger, I don't think you get to go back once no, you, you don't. You don't. Started your turn, so mm -hmm. that that one is the least least forgiving one that you really need to be like, careful about. Yeah, and that's probably one of the most one of the most played locations. That and McDuck Manor at the moment are the most played locations. <laughs> Seem so. to be Pridelands. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, next one's from Empowered MGR. During casual play, I prefer keeping my latest ink card face up in my inkwell for the remainder of my turn. Then I flip a face down after turn ends. Just helps a ton for both players to remember what took place during crazy combo turns. I actually do like this in, in casual play. Honestly, I think it will help people to remember it, but you cannot do this in, in competitive play at all. You cannot leave your inked card uh, upwards because it helps your opponent continuously remember what card you inked and also yourself, right? The idea is you say, I inked this card, I put it down. And then you basically, if your memory is good enough, you have to remember everything you inked, which if you're playing a software deck, is hard because you ink a lot of things. But um, I will say I do like this for, for casual play. It does make sense to me on the more, the more casual games. Yeah, I, th I think some people also did it at the tournament in Poland, which I didn't mind, but I think like technically you can't do it. Yeah, I agree. Next one's from The Ego. Hey guys, I'm the one who had the question involving luck in games a couple of weeks ago. Admittedly, when I typed that comment, I was drunk and feeling defeated from a bad loss streak that night. Your talks on luck not being an important factor on any player has really brought me back up and feeling more confident in my gameplay. And I wanted to say thank you for the insight. Keep doing what you're doing. And I'll be on the lookout for a 47 percenters shirt. Yeah, guys, check that out coming soon. Yeah, there was another comment which I didn't include, but it was like they wrote out some sort of sequence. Basically, they wrote out the number of uninkables they had in the, their deck, and then they wrote out that they drew a hand of uninkables. It was like very unlikely. And they're like, mm -hmm. they're like, unlucky situations do exist. Well, let me clarify. We never said you can't be unlucky. What we did, what we said is there is no human being on this planet that is unlucky. That is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Like no one actually is just straight up unlucky. Um, and there's a big difference between I got unlucky in this scenario versus I am unlucky and these situations affect me in a way that is different from everybody else. That is not, that's not the case. I mean, I guess, I guess technically there, there could be a player that's like, will get the worst end of variance in his most important matches and you could describe that as unlucky up until some point but the the fallacy in that is none of that means that you will be less likely to have got variance going forward mm -hmm. sure next one's from rachel uh come up and talk to us i know you guys play a lot of other games too but thank you for being for bringing such a wholesome attitude to the lorcan community good luck this weekend thank you rachel uh, anybody yeah, say hi to you in po yeah we, we we had a few people. Uh, it was really cool. Well, I think we had a lot of. Uh, I mean, I've gotten this at other events as well, where people kind of. You, I'm sure you've got this, Brandon, as well. People kind of look at you for a bit and go like, mm, "Is that the is that the guy? Is that the guy?" And then they come over and they start talking. But um, yeah, it was really nice. It was really want. nice. Yeah, go for it. So I was in the Calling Cincinnati 2022. I'm with my friend uh, Zach Bunn. He's uh, he's a pretty big media fig figure in TCG games. Does like big distribution for a lot of games that are not the big three. Um, they have a they have a YouTube channel called Team Covenant. So I didn't know this person was coming up to say hi to me. Basically, we're walking out of the venue um, together. We're just talking. Some guy comes up and he's like, he's like, "Hey, Brendan," and he goes, "You're a lot smaller than I expected." And then he walked <laughs> away. That was it. That was it. That oh, was man. it. And I swear to God, till this day, that is just an absolute meme in flesh and blood. Because <laughs> it was just the most bizarre, deadpan, 100% serious, by the way, just says that. And he goes, okay. And then he walks away. And we thought it, honestly, we laughed so hard. We thought it was so funny. But it was just like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> so random. The, big, the biggest thing is, I guess, there's lots of names in the community that I know, and once they tell me what their like in-game name or pixelborn name is, I, I do know who they are, but there's no face attached to that. So I can't recognize people just based on how they look because their face isn't out there. Mm. Well, I, th well, I, I don't know if face is out there. I think I think Moyen got 
we're, it's it's a weird one. Moya got recognized more for because he jammed so much Pixelborn that pe the amount of people that came up said, Oh, Moyne, yeah, I played you in Pixelborn. I was this dude, and then Moyne's like, Oh, yeah, I played you. So <laughs> that was really cool, for sure. Also, someone asked for, for me to sign their playmat, which made me feel very what? important. Oh, my God. They didn't ask me, so I guess I guess I, I ain't too important. But uh, uh, after rank one, you'll, you'll get some. You get some. Refresh. After rank one, sure. After after I cast the first uh, Lorcana challenge, yeah, there you go. All right, next one's from Spencer. In honor of this podcast, and because I go second about eighty percent of the time, my dice seem to hate me. Despite that, I'm still seventy percent win rate player at local, so I made a forty seven percent club T shirt and wear it to multiple events. Can't wait to wear. An official shirt. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to get it out there. It seems like people uh, really want this. I this also feel like I go second 80% of the time. That's crazy. I thought I was the only person. <laughs> I think oh, a lot man. of people feel that way. <laughs> mm. Just inherently. But also also the, the lore counter thing. I think maybe we can make that. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That'd be cool. I mean, I sent, I sent, uh, I sent these guys some... Uh, some images of actual metal tokens that like count lore and stuff. There's somebody that I know in Flesh and Blood that does metal tokens, and we can probably do that for Lorcana. Yeah, I mean, the things we're doing right now is the t-shirt, the playmat, and then we're thinking about doing a dice, and then the one on the dice just says 47%. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get snake guys, you just get 47% of 47%. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, next one's from Matt. Top the 1k while Hyper Aggro Lemon Lime Soup this weekend. I ate up all the Ruby Sapphire players in the room. There you go. That I mean, I, res I respect it, honestly. I respect anyone that brings the aggro deck. I actually respect the, the call because it's not, it's, it's not... You have to be confident to bring an aggro deck, honestly. And like, I guess like some people might bring aggro decks because they're on the cheaper side, which isn't a bad thing at all either. I think a, a really important thing that I want to really try and discuss uh, in the coming weeks leading up to the set championships is... Your deck does not have to be expensive to be good. Not mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Like there are multiple, like very, very good budget decks that are extremely meta. So do not feel like you need all of the best uh, legendary cards and stuff like that. Yes, there are some decks. I will say the best example being Green Steel. I think if you don't own probably the four legendary Ursulas, the deck is not going to work as well as you think it may work because it is a key central piece of the deck. But there's multiple. I think right now the best example that I can think of is a uh, deck that Zach Bivens brought to the the AK, which was pretty much just like a amethyst steel budget deck, kind of a tempo y aggro deck, and it did really really well. So I think there's two categories right now. There's hmm. steel and not steel. That's my yeah, that's, that's my gauge fair. on price <laughs> because like steel has Robin Hood and uh, Beast, and they're just like those cards yeah, compared I to other cards are insane. Mm. During the tournament in Poznan, I had so many people talk to me and saying, oh, they were playing One Piece before, but they stopped because it's so expensive and Lorcana's cheaper. But, but like, yes, like the cheapest decks in Lorcana are much cheaper than cheapest decks in One Piece. But all, all the decks that I'm... Okay, Ruby Amethyst is also not too super expensive. But like Sapphire Steel, Ember Steel, two decks that I'm very interested in, I think I'd probably have to pay three to 400 in singles too just to get them together. Mm -hmm. But Bre yeah, Bre Brennan is definitely right. It is pretty much those two specific cards. Yeah. I think if you take those cards out, the deck becomes a lot cheaper pretty fast. Yeah, those but, cards are crazy, unfortunately. Yeah, I think if you're looking to play Lorcan on a budget, honestly, you kind of just have to avoid the steel decks. <laughs> and then if you do that, like, it's hella cheap. It's it's actually really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, next one's from Pay No Heed. Uh, response to location Lord Trigger. So after some digging, the person you gave uh, the response was not a developer. The actual line is, it is mandatory, so if both players miss it, then it's a failure to maintain the game state. The judge would most likely get the player to add it and issue warnings to both players. Multiple um, GRVs. Yeah, GRVs can result in match losses and even DQs. Okay, so there is the true clarification. So, But then in that, in that instance, if it's missed, like, who would call the judge, if that makes sense? I don't know if it matters, to be honest, but who would who would call the judge? Probably the person that missed the that missed the benefit, like sure. missed the benefit. Um, yeah, or or they just don't call a judge so that they both not both get a warning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, like there's which, there's yeah. these rules in TCGs that like you can recognize just as a logical thinking person. Like, okay, I this is a rule, but this makes no sense. Like, 
Why would I? So let's say he missed the trigger and my opponent is like, doesn't want it back. They're like, okay, I missed the Lord trigger. It's the following turn. We're in agreement, but it's like, we technically had a game rule violation. Should we call a judge and both get warnings? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, if a judge sees it, I guess they both get a warning. Also, shout out to Pay No Heat because he's the, the top G that, that bought me the cards without even attending the event. Still oh, nice. just like, Davis made the cards, brought them to me, so I could play. Yeah, shout out to Michael. He's he's a good friend. I think he's actually uh, he should be a judge at Lille, which is going to be pretty awesome. Um, next comment from Maximum. I assume this is unlikely, but wanted to ask it for fun. Do you think the devs will introduce a new ink color down the line? If so, what would it be? What theme would you like to see? It's a cool question. Interesting question. I don't, uh, I don't find the answer. Oh, uh, you? Wait, okay. You just I think no. say, like neutral. No, I think okay. no. Um, that, that's not a fun answer. I said unfun. I you said, said unfun, unfun answer. Fun. Yeah. Okay. He's like, Moyen's like, oh my god. Moyen's like, what's fun? No. <laughs> so, so when you say so, neutral is the only way they could go. So generic, right? Uh, can mm -hmm. fit in any deck. Um, but ultimately, for adding another color, the color pie is like very critical to the identity of a game and like how making things feel unique and actually make it feel fresh i think that you can see you can see how that system breaks down if you do actually do look on a draft or seal at the moment because you can put all the colors together and it's like mm -hmm. level one thinking is i get more choices but at the, in the end you actually see that you have less choice because you have to just pick the better card every single time you're not actually making meaningful decisions a lot of the time um but all that is to say that i think that the like the color high in a sense we have six colors now is like very critical to like the core gameplay experience and to expand to another color it likely it would be very hard to make it feel unique and meaningful in a way that would actually improve the game also the the sort of debt that you build up by now having to service that entire other color um is it's a lot to work with and flesh and blood faces this issue because they add new heroes all the time and now you when you come out of the set what heroes do you service? What heroes do you not service? And it leads to the situation where some maybe somebody is like a, a Bolton player and then their their hero in their class hasn't gotten new cards for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. Hearthstone, I think Hearthstone did every class every time. I think it's pretty common, correct me if I'm wrong, but like most TCGs have six, right? I think Magic Magic has six, five, right? Five, right? Oh, Magic has five, okay. Um, yeah, I was, like, I was kind of thinking about it and like as cool as it would be, like... Uh, I'm gonna kind of compare this to Hearthstone, but it's also very different. Like Hearthstone took years to make uh, a new class, which was Demon Hunter, and then they made Death Knight. And I do think with the way Hearthstone's going, the kind of direction uh, it's, it's been really, really fun lately. I think they they could definitely introduce like Monk in the future. I think that be could, could be really cool. But it's it's very different when it's um, digital. It's a lot easier to do and stuff like that. I mean, it's no no easy task. But uh, like Brendan said as well, it's like if you add a new color, then does that mean for every set four, then suddenly you add another, I don't know, 80-ish cards costs to maintain the set. Like every new set is now this much bigger and stuff like that. Like it's a, mm. the, it's I a like huge neutral thing though. to do. That, that's a neutral side. Neutral, is... neutral could be cool. Yeah. Um, so just to add my two cents, I think the biggest um, difficulty to overcome would, and, and I don't think it's impossible. I think it could be fun, but like the biggest difficulty to, to overcome is that not, in every set right now, I think we're building memories, but we're also building identity of the color mm -hmm. uh, along the way. And then if something um, gets added later, it needs to have all that ident identity and, uh, and depth at once so that it feels comparable to the other colors, even, even just in how it feels, not even in its power level. And I think that might just be a little too much to do at once. But like, like it's not impossible, but I think it's very difficult. Yeah, I think if they did as well, wouldn't they? I, I I feel like they'd have to make the color like super appealing and feel super powerful. I mean, we know car card games do this all the time. I think one of the best examples is actually Marvel Snap. How they, I'm pretty sure they've publicly stated that they always try to release like season pass cards in a very appealing state so that people <laughs> will buy them. Right? I mean, we all we all know it's true, right? Loki is like probably one of the best examples. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's it's a funny thing for you to say because I actually just had Glenn on my Marvel. Oh yeah, podcast. I watched it. Yeah, I watched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they like to shoot high. We'll say that. I don't mm. know if they specifically say they make them more powerful, but they like to shoot high and recrack from there. 
We'll say that. Well, it, it's the, the funny thing about it is it is actually very valid because it does entice people it's to, a better system. to do it. I, I promise yeah, it's, it makes a, it's a better much system. better than releasing new cards that no one wants to play. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. One thousand yeah. percent. All right, next comment from Chris. None of the stores in my area are doing the championships like Brendan described. Most of them were offered it to their local players first, but then they opened it up to all players and all of my local stores are also taking signups online. That's very weird. I actually had an experience with this. So uh, I have four booked pretty much now oh, okay. for, yeah. So one one for each for each uh, weekend. So Saturday, yeah. Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, one, I will be traveling over to the UK and uh, playing with Raven, which is going to be pretty fun. But the one on the 21st, I believe, was, it's quite, it's probably the smallest local store. And all I heard originally was like, it's happening on this date. I was like, cool. When there's an update, they'll probably post a link. We can buy tickets or whatever. Uh, I think I wrote in the chat. I was like, oh, is there any update for when tickets go live? And everyone's like, oh yeah, it's, it's fully signed up for already. I'm like, well, what, what, <laughs> where, where, where do you sign up for? And I think a big thing of it was at the locals, it was like, oh yeah, everyone that's here, like you're just in and stuff like that, which, which I mean, we've talked about is, is, is fair and stuff like that. But I think since hearing that feedback, uh, they've opened up a few more slots. So I actually did get in, which is, which is nice. But I mean, there's, there's always like so many limitations, right? Certain stores only mm -hmm. have certain sizes. Um, and, and you know, you, you do want to offer it to your, your, local players as, as best as possible. But at the same time, if you can open it up to that few more players, at the end of the day, you're a business and it helps you make more money. So that should also be taken into account and, and not just trying to please uh, your, your your people. But so I guess yeah, I, I picked this comment because my situation has changed slightly. Mm -hmm. um, some have opened. One. <laughs> One has opened. Uh, it's like a huge store in Dallas called Common Grounds. They have a huge event space. But other than that, like almost every store I talk to is opening like day of for signups, which is really weird. And it's my least favorite way of doing things because mm. sometimes what they're effectively asking you to do is to, well, first of all, I don't know if they're actually going to pre-sell them to their locals, but they're like, hey, we're going to, you can get a day of where it's like drive 30, 45 minutes here and then maybe not get in. I'm like, yeah, that's a no go for me. Yeah, that sucks, man. I've heard a few people uh, say that as well. That uh, it's not that bad. Be... And there's a comment we had a couple months or a couple weeks ago, maybe even last week, that was talking about like the promo dissonance between people coming in and spiking promos. But they said something really uh, insightful at the end, which is that six to 12 months, none of this will matter. Same thing about these set championships. Six to 12 mm -hmm. months, none of it will matter. There'll be plenty of higher tier events for competitive spiky players to sort of get that I don't know, scratch that itch. And these things, while they might still occasionally sell out, it won't be like this where it's like this rush and it feels like you can't get in. Like all this stuff is standard growing pains. Same thing happened to Fab. Oh, also, I want all of us to try and give a rough estimation of the promo now because we, it was really interesting. Myself and mine, we spoke to one of the vendors who had like very, very high value lore. He had like yeah. all the D23 Lorcana cards. Like, you know, s some of those original things go for like 2K, 3K. Yeah, and we were like, okay, we want your honest opinion. What do you think it's gonna it's gonna go for? And I'm not gonna lie, the price he said does make a lot of sense. So, Brendan, I want your I want your take. Give me a number. <sighs> Shit. All right. Um, four hundred dollars. <laughs> okay. Okay. Brendan said it. Moin, what do you think? I mean, I, I was there when the vendor said it. So. Yeah. So you could, we could just both say the same value, right? I think. Yeah. And he said like, did he say fifty to a hundred? He said, yeah, I, I say 75. $5, okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's 75. Because if you think there's, there are so many stores that have got shoot access to this. I was going to shoot 200, but I just had to go high. But I think that, I think I would go, after a couple of weeks, let it settle, min 200. Nah, fuck, maybe I'm wrong. Nah, I don't think so, bro. I think the 100 mark, if it, I, I think it's going to be 100 mark, yeah. Yeah. All right. All be right. interesting. Okay, next one's from Gabe. Uh, Gabe says, are you guys totally discounting Mufasa? Ruby Amber has a decent matchup into Blue Steel, especially with Prince Eric's. I actually do agree with Gabe. I think we completely missed uh, yeah. um, Mufasa. I'm not going to say, I will not put it in a tier one slot, but I think it's a very, very good deck, very playable deck. It, I would say, has a pretty decent matchup into most things. It's just like a solid kind of list, but uh, I don't know. Like It's funny. Like It's actually the first deck I played of set three and I had a lot of fun with it, but me personally, I just don't know if I'd bring it to a tournament, but I don't want to uh, put it down. I think it's a yeah. very, very good deck. I, sure. was, I was getting waxed uh, by this as I was playing Ruby Amethyst. And I was getting wrecked by this deck. Yeah, mm. I, I'm not backpedaling. I think the deck is a pile of mediocrity. <laughs> it's like, if you, if you, if you want to play it, sure, I think it's 
it's very easy to play and it's like it's like all right but i in this current state of the matter i would not bring it if i if my number one goal is to win the tournament and even i, I don't think any meta shift meta shift will get me to play mufasa and that doesn't mean mufasa can't win a tournament i just think you'll have like a little bit lower chances than are, are you just saying it's too easy should, to play should. more in I'm, what, what, what do you mean? Too easy? It is very easy to play. <laughs> uh, I, but I, if if a deck's easy to play, it's the best deck in the format. I play it, but I I don't think Mufasa is that. Sure, sure, yeah, it makes sense. And next one's from Sorcerer. Pride lands over flutes. Ditch the last uh, effort over Pinocchio. Ditch the last effort yeah. over Pinocchio. <laughs> you had me at Pride lands over flutes, but where? <laughs> yeah, where? I was like, what? What are your thoughts on this? Need feedback? Okay, Pride lands over flutes, but the card we revealed. It's actually so funny. I did like a chaos draft as a side event at the Poland event, which was Wait, really what cool. Is, what is way, a chaos? Like, oh, so they, they shuffled one, two, three sets into we it? We did set one, set two, and then uh, two, set three packs. And uh, I think uh, someone played a last ditch effort against me. It was like, that's our card. That's the card we revealed. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't I don't know. Like, I do think I will continually say, continually say that out of the two cards that we did reveal, I think the... Uh, last ditch effort was the better card over that wrench that I don't think we'll ever see play unless we get a location that specifically cares about it being healed. But right now, I think Pinocchio is way better than last ditch effort, mainly because there's a really, really cool play. I mean, this this happened to me uh, when I was playing Blue Steel. Like, I do think Blue Steel is really favored against Ruby Amethyst, but the opponent can go, like, if there's already Pinocchio out on board that they use to kill, like, your Mr. Shmee, then on turn five, if if... If on turn four for you, you've used your quill to ramp into uh, six, let's just say six cost Gaston, because that's actually the best example mm -hmm. where this works. Your opponent, if there's already a Pinocchio on the board, can just bounce the Pinocchio with a Madame in Fox, replay the Pinocchio, exert your Gaston and kill it, and you've got nothing to sing. And that's a big reason why, honestly, in most situations, the best card to play when you're doing your ramp thing with quill against uh, nearly any deck is just always Cogsworth, because it has ward, it has that protection, you can nearly guarantee that you're going to sing the wheel. Um, but yeah, I just think Pinocchio is way more versatile than Last Ditch Effort. But that doesn't mean that the card won't see play. I just think for the moment, you shouldn't play it over other cards. It won't see play. It's okay. The, the only time... Yeah, I mean, it, it did see play, but like it shouldn't. Yeah. Like, so, hmm. like, there was like a few red purpose. Of red Wait, was there actually? Yes. I, I played I against? A, a, fr uh, a friend of mine actually lost to Last Ditch Effort at one point. But that doesn't mean like it should be, should be seeing any play. Also, the only time... I really needed my Cogsworth to sing my Holy World was game three of the top cut against Red Blue. And oh, they had the Lady Tremaine only out, so I couldn't sing it and lost too much tempo from there. My yeah. favorite Pinocchio play is it leads to, I mean, it, it kind of plays into first play advantage being egregious. It's just Rafiki turn one, opponent plays one drop, Pinocchio one drop, kill it. And especially mm -hmm. if it gets in the Ruby Amethyst Mirror, it's like, Oh, all of the snakes! <laughs> like it's just they're just they they're freaking useless. It's actually such a swingy uh, early game play, destroying the one drop. In one of Spessy's losses, he also got he was playing Emerald Steel. He got completely destroyed by Ruby Amethyst because not only did they Pinocchio their Ursula uh, to trade it off, but then also their next Ursula was played into the five ink turn, and then the Fox Pinocchio. The Fox the Ursula Pinocchio again. play is insane. Honestly, yeah, it's all good. All right. Our last comments from Jay Sav. I really enjoyed playing mid range Jafar Wheel, and I'm bringing it to the set championship. Do you have any tech advice for this meta? I will say that we did see one Jafar player make it into the top 32 in Poland. Um, and I don't have an insane amount of experience within the matchup, but I do, th I do think from my, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the worst matchup for that deck is Amber Steel because it's really, really difficult to win. And funny enough, as Moyen, his top 32 came faced Red Blue, which, which is the worst matchup. The Jafar player also faced Amber Steel and just lost uh, pretty I, much instantly. I do think Sapphire Steel is also quite good against Jafar, but it also depends on the number of Zeus. Yeah, of yeah Zeus, yeah, Zeus is an incredible counter to Jafar. But a cool thing that the Jafar player was telling me about, uh, he was mentioning a cool combo that he did with bosses on, uh, boss on the roll, which is fair because you, you definitely play that card within that, that combo deck. They had a Blue Fairy on board. Uh, they must have sang bosses on a roll or whatever to pretty much line up the exact uh, Jafar on top and then the whole new world after it. They had a smaller Jafar on board. Uh, they shifted the Jafar into the smaller one, which triggered the Blue Fairy, which drew them the whole new world. And then they uh, 
they sang. So they basically got eight lore. Like that's that's a really cool example of how good bosses on a roll can be if you have like the blue fairies and you have a bit of like a uh, uh, card draw synergy and stuff like that. So I've talked about it a lot. It's a deck. Believe it or not, I've actually still not played any Jafar Wheel yet just because I'm a huge lover of combo decks, but I still feel personally that I want one or two more pieces of the puzzle to for it to become like a uh, little bit more consistent. But that's not to say that the deck isn't really fun. But yeah. Yeah, a little bit more. You want it to be true solitaire before you pick it up. <laughs> Zero I, I love honestly, I I love I love OTK decks, but I I don't think it's at that stage yet. S still has too much interaction for Kava. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not degenerate enough yet anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. um if you want to get your question read out next week's podcast use a comment on youtube let's head into the main topic um just meta developments right we're looking we're looking towards the, uh, the store championships as well as set championships um moyan i want to give you the floor to just break us just break down what you wrote to me earlier because this is honestly everything you wrote is pretty much everything i've experienced on the pixelborn ladder um all these different changes in the respective ink combinations so i'm just going to pass over to you um, yeah, so I think, so I try to go through all the popular decks and how they are evolving within their deck list, but also maybe the popularity of these deck lists, um, which, which, what, what, what does it favor? Um, so just going through the different, uh, color combinations and how they're evolving. I would say Sapphire Steel lists are getting more and more refined and more and more similar, except for Savage, just playing like a 20 card different version somehow. And, um, I guess, because it's him, and the his deck looked intriguing enough. It's something that I have to put a lot of time in to to test whether whether there is something um, that's comparable or in some matchups even better than than the list that is being popular right now. So the, what's different in Savage is that they're playing for one jump aheads, four zoos. Um, they, they usually has a crab in there, and the biggest difference is probably the Robin Hood. So. Um, which also lines up very well together. He plays more four drops and more zoos, so the one jump heads better. But because of the four jo one jump uh, one jump heads, you also have the good curve where you go like Robin Hood into one jump ahead, and then you can do any one drop plus um, shift Robin Hood and wheel. So th that is a, a strong combo. The only downside to the decks, I feel like there's a, f um, a few more like low value cards to be drawing into later that that can hurt the deck, like. Um, even even Robin Hood's like cards that don't impact the board um, super quickly and don't draw cards on their own. But there's also by the way the crabs come in. I then, do um, I do uh, sorry sorry to interrupt you more. I was gonna yeah. say I do actually like the Robin Hoods for the sole reason that in the mirror match it's better against uh, Zeus. Like that six health is so important versus five health uh, to be better protected against Zeus. Um. I also do want to clarify just for anyone listening, because I was confused reading this as well. When Moyen says some crabs, he means Tamatoa. I was like, you have like crab and sapphire steel. I was like, okay, yeah, it's just, it's just Tamatoa. So that makes sense. Tamatoa is crab, right? <laughs> no, he is. Yeah, I'm just so used crab. to like, uh, I'm so used to Merlin crab. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a lot of Ember Steel variations. The one that is gaining the most popularity right now on the uprise would be the Pride Lens versions, but still at the same time, both Flute and Lantern are, are going strong. Um, and Ember Steel, I think, is at least at this point right now, because that might change in the future, is has gotten to the point of popularity where maybe I would actually entertain the thought of playing one or two Let It Go in my Sapphire Steel deck. Because a lot of the time I was the guy that was saying, I can win that matchup without it. If it's not that much, I really don't want to play these cards in my deck. But maybe we're at the point where we could actually be including Let It Go. Um, then Emerald Steel has been like completely innovated, mostly, mostly by Spessy, who put a lot of time into it, where it's no longer this bucky list or slow type list that plays into like Beast and Tinkerbells, but the way he's been playing it is just with very low to the ground, more discard stuff. It's a, and then you have Prince John plus, um, plus the discards of Sun Shell. He plays a few Hypnotize and four Fire Tuck, which I think is the biggest difference. Um, plus, it's just playing very little late game, so you can fill out these uh, these curves by just adding Mr. Smee or Flynn Rider or on top of it to really pressure and finish the game quickly after opponent one sort of resources. There's, but there's the no, same, yeah. sorry, I was going to say, yeah, there's, there's no card that's higher than four, I believe, in Spassy's deck, right? Um, yes, that, that is yeah. correct. But mm. also what's interesting is that at the same time, there was a, 
a very t high top end deck that also made it into into top cut in in Poland, which was actually playing like po a completely different, mo no Murfolks and Emerald Steel, Paul Lucifer, Bibbidi Barbidi Boos, Elsa top end, um, which was very interesting to see, um, and I, I thought deserved a, a shout. Then um, I think if we look at the meta more for more of a, a higher ground and. I would say that the, in the recent weeks, it's been developing more towards the Sapphire Steel decks becoming better, or e even in the recent month, because they um, realize they can just out-tempo, or not out-tempo, they can have a quicker win condition than Red Purple by just playing the Dimes. But now we're at the, at the side of things where a lot of decks are just aware of that and playing more item removal, mm -hmm. lots of Steel decks playing Benjas, which is a hostile environment towards Sapphire, but Sapphire is still holding its own. Um, but that means even red blue, which is already good against uh, blue gray, is also playing Judy Hab Judy Hops, which makes that matchup very hard for them to lose. Um, and now, because there's more item hate in the meta, uh, Ruby Amethyst has been cutting down on the books again. First of all, because there's more item removal, but also because there's less Ruby Amethyst being played than maybe in the recent weeks, so it's less necessary. Most people are now on one or zero books, and instead they are going back to um, trying to be the aggressor without relying on the items um, just by playing mini mouse, but also they shifted their one drops because um, Amber Steel has become more popular recently, um, which meant that they again needed a one drop that doesn't get one shot by let the storm rage on, so that they still have it on board post. Um, like, they can still play it into a Cinderella and have something stick into the Madam Mim. So now they're playing more one threes as one drops, mini more mini mouse to to pressure and be the aggressor against these Sapphire decks. And um, against the Emerald, the Discard decks, they're just trying to, to cheese them because they're so bad into locations, just playing for tempo, get down the locations, and then try to go from there. Um, then what else did I miss? So I mean, also in line with the one threes, I see a lot more um, teeth and ambitions in these decks, which mm -hmm. is probably not the best use, like the best case for aggro. Because I felt like there was a lot of room for aggro to come back into the meta game uh, with some of the meta ships that were happening, especially the transition to blue red. But now with even some of the non steel decks adding in teeth and ambitions, I think we're pushing aggro out even more once yeah. again. And, uh, and again, it's happening kind of accidentally. Mm -hmm. And not that people are not aware, it's just, I think Teeth came back mostly to combat um, Ember Steel mm -hmm. and, and also Green Steel to, to get rid of the, the Flynn and Merfolk without having to discard a card. But at the same time, it is also very good against Aggro. It's not the reason they put it in, but again, that's like Aggro accidentally being pushed out by this and the prominence of Steel. And uh the other um, development in Ruby Amethyst is just that because the mirror is less popular, Medusa is a little bit less important, and people are playing more Tremains, which is a very good card against the, uh, both of the Sapphire versions, um, Sapphire Steel and, and Red Blue. Uh, not only because it removes stuff that Medusa clearly cannot remove, but also it questing for two is extremely important because you need to be, like every lore point you get in in that matchup is extremely crucial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that, that was my TED talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think some people underappreciate like how unfair Pride Lands can be against some of these decks. Like even in the Amber Steel Mirror, like I mean, the card can just feel so polarizing, especially when you have access to a move off the back of that in the form of like the Storm Rage and Strength of Raging Fire or the Zeus card. Like I don't know, I find oftentimes, especially in the play, that early Pride Lands are gaining me egregious amounts of lore in some of these matchups. Also against these Green Steel decks, like. What they <laughs> they just have to try to like race you. It's actually insane. They can't do any damage to these these pylons. Um, just a really interesting location to utilize, and it sort of fills the function of getting that almost passive lore that these flutes were. And flutes, you know, probably transitioning out of the meta also because of like all this item hate that has been included. Like steel is just a deck that can. Uh, for a very cheap cost, include item hate in its deck in the form of Benja, which is like a pretty reasonable body, a 2-3 quest for 2. Uh, so we've seen a lot of that in, in the metagame. So we're very much in flex, which is just fascinating. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, and I, I guess at this point I would love to just tell you, hey, for the set championship, just play this deck and you will get your, you, you get your win, you get the promo card. But I, I think 
what what I can tell you is that there's lots of viable options, and you will be rewarded for being maybe on top of what you th expect your local meta to be, and at the same time just playing something. At some of the, like because there's while there's lots of viable options, you don't need to be playing. Yeah, Mufasa. <laughs> um, but just pick any of these decks, get comfortable with it, get good at it, um, stay on top of your meta, maybe change a few cards, depending on what you're expecting. And you should be good to go, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a great point, Moyen. Like, if I'm looking at my local meta, honestly, okay, I don't know if I should say this, because I know there's so many people from my <laughs> locals that listen to this pod. <laughs> But uh, <clears throat> I would heavily expect a lot of Amber Steel because my locals, uh, there's, there's a lot of really good Amber Steel players there that might incentivize me to bring um, Ruby Sapphire because I still think ultimately Ruby Sapphire dunks on the deck. It's uh, probably a little, I don't know, maybe the matchup's not as easy as it was, but Red Blue is definitely still super, super favored into it. Like you've still got Maui to deal with the, the Pride Lands and mm -hmm. be prepared for board clears and stuff like that. So. That's just a, an example I want to give people is like, oh, if you think if you're if you think your locals is a lot of amber steel, maybe consider ready, bringing red blue or just bringing a amber steel list that you feel pretty comfortable going into the mirror match. Or if there's a lot of uh, low to the ground decks that at least amber steel can kind of clean them up. So exactly, I just want to echo what Moyne said. Try and get a gauge on what you think the local meta is going to be and 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 take your deck from there. I don't think there's one right answer of saying play this deck and you're going to win every set championship because that is simply not the case. Yeah, I'm leaning towards, personally, I'm leaning towards um, Amber Steel or Ruby Amethyst. I would consider Blue Steel, but uh, I don't know. It's in an interesting spot. I just don't know how many Red Blue is going to show up to my local metagame. Um, the Red Blue matchup just seems pretty tough. It's yeah, so, yeah, it's mine so tough. can tell you how tough it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, so I think it's also from us being like risk averse and also because I think inherently we feel the need of being in control. And if you bring Sapphire Steel, I, I can guarantee you, even if you're playing against a like mediocre red blue player, you will have a tough time. Mm -hmm. And that, that that's just not the situation you want to be in. Um that doesn't mean that you should never be taking these risks because they can definitely pay off. And it's fine to to drop a game here and there for for a bad matchup every now and then. But I think that's why Maybe inherently we are uh, favoring decks like Ember Steel or, or Red Purple, where at least we feel like we're always in control. Yeah, <clears throat> Red Purple actually seems pretty solid in, uh, in this metagame. It's just, it doesn't have as polarizing matchups on the positive end either, like you get with Amber Steel or, or Blue Steel. Um, but it does feel like it's it's definitely in every game. I do like the, cha the changes over to some of the 1-3s as well, uh, especially in the context of how much Steel is in the metagame. Um, and also cutting out like the books, uh, it, you know, cutting down on books because the Benjas are absolutely, there's just so many freaking Benjas right now, bro. <laughs> like, there's, there's yeah, so many. I, I do really agree with, I saw a, a tweet from, from Pavel, the creator of Pixelborn there, I think it was yesterday or maybe it was this morning saying that, uh, obviously last week on the pod we mentioned that like Ruby Amethyst is such a consistent pick and it always shows up in like top eight, top eights of tournaments and stuff like that. But recently it is really interesting because we haven't seen too many win, but they're always there. So it's, uh, it's, it's still a deck you can really consider bringing and I'm sure one of them is going to make it someday yeah right? I mean for for the useless anecdotal evidence that I can provide I did take it to locals like uh last week and I went 4-0 with it mm -hmm. and I had a couple close games like at best but ultimately it felt like the the deck was it was fine into everything and I played I played two blue steel <laughs> and I feel like the blue steel matchup is actually pretty tough Mm -hmm. To be honest, Especially but if you know the, the 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 big thing is it is a very tough matchup. But if you know what you're doing, you can that you can beat it. But also, you really, I mean, it it definitely helps if your opponent doesn't get the quill or bricks a little bit, right? That's uh that definitely helps in the matchup. If if I order, so my 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 set championship is in ten days, the one I signed up for. Mm -hmm. If I order all my cards now, I get them in time, right? Sure. Uh, sure. Oh, hopefully. What? Maybe that is not a guarantee. I think well, that's a stretch, bro. Because if you, I don't know, you guys are doing card market, right? If you yeah. get them all from Germany, yeah. But if you get them from anywhere else in Europe, you should look. Maybe local. not. You should look locally yeah. and see if you can buy from people that are also going to be there on the day. Like yeah, but it's so discount. much more work to do that. 
Well, it should Moin, just be providing I, I, a list. I, I, I got you, Moin. I, I know so many really good German players who play Lorcanla from from some events. So I uh, just hit me up, and I got you, buddy. Yeah, I prefer to do that, that than than buy a TCG player because sometimes they take like a month, bro. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I've always gotten them in, within a couple of days so far, but I haven't ordered that much. Also, there was there was someone in the comments offering me cards like a few weeks ago. I remember that. It, yeah, it, you know, if that offer still exists, I might I might pick <laughs> up on it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, if you listen to the podcast, you enjoy it. You can mail cards to Moin. No, I'm kidding. You can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It helps so, so, so much. Video version of this on YouTube at youtube.com slash at podcana podcast. Hit that subscribe while you're there. We're all on Twitter, Brendan APG, Moin underscore HS, Colotech underscore CG. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week.